Hello, I'm Dr. Ron Eaglin coming to you from Daytona State College and this is CEN3722, Human Computer Interaction. And today we're gonna to talk about interaction design. And what do we really mean when we talk about interaction design? I'm gonna to get to the nuts and bolts of how we design the systems themselves and the little tools that we've got for the users to be able to use in those system designs that you're gonna be able to use in your design process. Right now, with this lecture, the only ones we're gonna really talk about are essentially the personal computer-based tools. Now, don't discount the personal computer-based tools because most business processes are being performed still on a computer or you know, standard desktop or laptop computer. We are gonna talk about phone, we are gonna talk about tablet, but we're gonna talk about those interface elements in a different lecture. So what we wanna do is be able to understand the pieces that we've got available to us that we can use in our design that that end user is gonna see and, and they're gonna be able to perform their task. You're gonna use these in the design to help them perform that task. You should be pretty familiar with most of these and how these operate. So we'll move through them at a pretty rapid pace, but um, you know, it is still important to understand what they are and understand how they operate, but also understanding that most basic computer users that you're gonna have are gonna have a good familiarity with these little, what you might call them widgets or buttons or whatever, they're gonna be familiar with them and using them in a consistent manner is gonna make for a nice design. So we've got, you know, most systems are trans, that you're gonna be designing for business processes are gonna be transactional based systems. You are going to have a procedure that they follow. It may be a linear procedure. They're gonna do this on a computer screen it's gonna have users or interface elements that you've put together. You design the screens. You decide where the elements go on the screen. You decide what screen goes to what screen as the user interface designer. But in the end, it's a transaction. It's you go, a user goes into a system, performs their task, and finishes. So we want them to be most important to fit with the expectations of what they expect a system to do. Okay, what kinds of things they might they be doing? Well, they might be filling out forms. Before you get into the concept of how the form is gonna lay out, and most forms lay out fairly simply in a straightforward manner. You have a label on the left, a text box, a drop down, or something on the right, the label is right justified. The box is left justified. They go together. It's easy to put them together to understand that this label goes with this. The label is explanatory of what the user is going to be doing. The buttons on the bottom that actually that they use to say I'm done or I'm going to cancel or I want to apply. Those are all simple and self-explanatory. If there's mandatory fields, it tells you that. It specifies exactly where to go. These are just the basics of being able to create something like a form or any type of design that a user is gonna be comfortable with. And that's what we want. We want the user to be comfortable with this. We wanna avoid things like too many fields on a single page of a form or having them have to scroll down. Nothing annoys me more than having to go, I've, I've, I filled out the form. You know, where's the button? Well, I gotta scroll down. Oh, look, there's another page of form that I didn't even see. Okay. There's a lot of ways to handle this. Of course, you can have it in multiple pages. It can be in logical subgroups. That is all part of design. We're talking about what the tools are that you've got available to you. So let's look at first the menu. And let's look at the menu in terms of efficiency. We have a menu here and another menu here. It's the same menu. The novice user, 2.8 seconds, pull down, pull down, pick. The expert user, control O, control S, okay, 0.2 seconds. But it's the same menu. 
How do you learn the menu? Well, remember, we've talked a lot about learning and the user and the interface. It's right there in the menu. Users that become more and more expert, have more and more expertise are going to be able to see the shortcuts that go with the common tasks that they perform because they're right there in the menu system. And it's the same design. And menus we use all the, different all the time. So with that as an example, let's look a little bit about the interaction styles that you're going to have. How are you, how is your, your, how is your system that you design going to interact with the user? Well, there's the question and answer, okay? It asks, simply asks these things and the user answers. The menu system, which is a little bit more free form, just sits there and blinks at you, but the user actually has to go up there and pick out what they want from the menu itself. There's a standard form fill-in technique, which, uh, which are relatively straightforward. Then there's some complex ones, like the command line interface. Remember, before, user, before the GUI, okay, the graphical user interface, all the interfaces were command line. Command line interfaces, as powerful as they were, did limit the number of users that could use it because you had to know the commands. And there's actually conversational systems, and I don't even mean just systems that, 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 that talk. Because talk is a different, you know, speech recognition, all that's something different. But they actually use a natural language style interface. It may be typing. So, the question and answer style interface. Now, in this interface, the user is led through the process of performing the tasks that they want to perform. And it should be relatively easy to learn. So, for example, a wizard, like the graph wizard in Excel, where you simply say, I want to create a graph, and it steps you through step one of four, step two of four, step three of four. Okay. Great for novices. It can actually be very good for even advanced users. The wizard in Excel is actually bypassable. You can go straight to the graph if you know all the steps very and you can go through it very quickly. But this steps you through all the steps. It's a Q&A style. Okay. And that is a tremendously good style, especially if you know you're going to be dealing with novice users. It's also good that if you can develop a Q&A style and actually take that Q&A style and have other ways to do it so that as they learn, they can bypass them. The menu system is kind of the benchmark of all computer interfaces. We're all familiar with the menu. Um, now, the menu design isn't simply just sticking a bunch of options up in a menu. The menu is really a thoughtful process of determining what a user needs to do and then having that user be able to work, its, work their way to that option, finding it easily, and then being able to know what is going to happen when they click on that menu option. And I went through that slowly, but I went through it slowly because I want you to understand a menu is more than simply a list of choices up there at the top. It's a well thought out, grouped list of choices that should be intuitive to the user. Because a bad menu is just that. It is a bad menu. And a good menu, a user should be able to work through very quickly. Form fill-in systems, there's so much that can be said about form fill-in systems, about making sure that you do it right. There is an entire series of best practices associated with forms, making sure you do the forms correctly, that they're easy, that the user knows really what goes into each element of the form, that if it's a limited choice, it is given to you in the right type of interface, that you use the text boxes correctly, that they're the correct size. All of that is part of making a good form. It's not just putting out a bunch of options on a screen. Okay. Command line, well, <laughs> I don't know what I can really say about command line. Um, for those who like to use command line systems, and I am one of them, they are the most powerful systems because if you know those commands, you can get things to happen rapidly. They're very quick. But the blinking cursor terrifies most users. And um, 
reality is, is that you're probably not going to create a lot of command line systems. So we're going to kind of move through that. The conversational systems, and the conversational systems can also be part of a wizard. I had to put my good buddy Clippy up here. Um, Clippy is now dead. I don't know if Clippy will ever be revived, but there's, you know, if you really want to uh, uh, just Google Clippy must die, and I think you'll um, get yourself a good laugh. Clippy was an AI. It was a bot. Um, it used conversational English to be able to interact with you. It wasn't very good at it. It, it, you know, it, it was there for a while, but now we've gone on to much more complex AIs. And that is actually where a lot of things are going right now is to that AI design. So conversational systems are actually going to be seeing a fairly good resurgent, a resurgence. And conversation, conversational systems are very complex to design. You, as a human, when talking to another human, you don't know what they're going to say but you've got the capability of reacting to their speech relatively well because you've got the capability of understanding context and language and what they're saying. But now, thinking about this as a computer system and being able to anticipate that, that's a much more difficult thing to do. So, most users will directly manipulate things within the computer system. Okay, they're going to use a mouse. They're going to use the keyboard. As we move into other types of systems, it's going to be direct touch. You've got all sorts of different ways of dealing with direct touch, hand gestures, single tap. Okay, we're going to talk about those later. Almost all GUIs use a relatively common style of interface. Whether they're on a Macintosh or whether they're on a PC underneath Windows, okay, the tools are relatively the same. And those are the tools that, you're going to, that the users are going to actually use to manipulate the objects that you've put onto the screen. Now, there's a whole science behind all of this, and there's a lot of individual steps that I've seen designers miss, like creating the correct tab index and tab stops for users that like to use the tab to move between individual focused elements on a screen. And what I mean by focused elements is, at any given point in time, something on the screen, one text box, one radio button, is gonna have the focus of what is being entered. And ensuring that, and, the, and a tab stopped interface basically means the tab allows you to scroll and cycle between all of those focused elements. Designing that, that in itself well is important. So you're going to be using them. You're going to be designing them. We've talked, a little, we've talked about all the elements of recognition versus recall. Um, we've also talked about how expert users in systems that require you to go to multiple steps tend to get frustrated because they want to move faster. Okay. But the bottom line is they're easy to learn. They're straightforward and beginners can start with them. They can develop a model of how they're both supposed to behave in their head and be able to work through them. These are the systems that you use every day. This is your Excel and your Word and um, you know, the programs that you just commonly use. Now, screen control, um, what's the, we're actually, gonna, let's just go into it. The gadgets, the stuff that you're gonna use. We're gonna jump right into them. Buttons. Okay, <laughs> you use buttons. Buttons are, and, and buttons are, for one, buttons should be explanatory. You should never have a user not know what a button is going to do. Okay, that's the bottom line. Now, you've got lots of ways to make this happen. You can put a simple thing on the button that says print, and the user should think, okay, that's going to print. Or the button may say do it but they may not know what do it means. But you've also got the ability to put in tooltips so that if a mouse hovers above the button, the tooltip gives a better explanation. And that's a good self-documenting practice. 
you shouldn't put way too many buttons in a single window. It's always nice to have just a limited selection of them. Don't overload the users. Buttons are really used to say, do this now. Whatever it is you're doing, do it now. Common buttons, the ones that are just pretty much common in all systems, the OK, cancel, close, reset, apply, and help. Okay. Those all have a specific common meaning that are used in almost all graphical user interfaces, and you should not create an apply button that does what OK does or vice versa. Okay. They have a meaning. Apply. Apply means make the changes, but keep everything on the screen. When you click apply, it should not close the screen. Okay. Follow that convention and you're fine. Also, when designing buttons, okay, it is much better to try to keep everything on a single straightforward line. Sometimes that's impossible to do, but if you can keep the text of the button sparse and use a tooltip or something else to define the functionality of that, it's usually capable of doing. But when you move something from and make it two lines on the same button, that will confuse the user. Okay. Because they're now thinking, is it current? Orders, are there two different things? Novice users will think that. So that's important. Now, I said keep about six buttons on a screen. Well, I'm going to violate that right off the bat because toolbars are collections of buttons. Okay? But they're collections of buttons of things that you might want to do on a regular basis. And there's common elements for most toolbars. The undo, the redo, the cut, the copy, paste, save, open, all those types of, and they all have a common thing with it. You know, so there's tool tips. The interface for toolbars is typically consistent as possible. Copy, save, save, and this may be lost on users. <laughs> I was like this, this may be lost on users that aren't, I haven't been around in a while the computer, but for the save, we typically use a picture of a floppy disk. Okay. My, my kids have never seen a floppy disk. Well, they might have seen one in my office because they're this historical thing that they know about, but we still use that. Okay. But we've also gotten to the convention of knowing that that means save. So we still use it. Now, other types of buttons. Radio buttons, optional buttons, radio option buttons, the circle. It is the circle. It means select one of the choice. Limit the number of choices with these because one, they're going to take up a lot of screen in real estate. But the concept here is that you got a limited set of choices. That you just want to pick one and then move on. Radio button is a way to get, do that. If you need to select multiple, you now move to the checkbox. There a square. Now, how is it that one is a circle and one is a square? One means select one, one means select many. It's just something that we decided when we were designing the first interfaces long ago, and we've stuck with the convention, and it's been working very well with users. So follow the best practice guides that go with putting on these buttons here. You know, we like to align them vertically. We don't want to have too many. You want to put them in logical subgroups and orders. Okay. These are just simple, simple best practices. Text boxes. Everybody's seen the good old text box. Okay. However, it's a standard data entry. Okay. There's the text box. There's the text area, which is a different control. Text boxes are usually simply a single line for a small amount of information. A text area is multi-line in case you need to enter a paragraph or comments or something like that. It's a little bit larger. It's nothing more than a text box that takes up more than two rows. Okay. Standard data entry, we use them all the time. Use the right one. If you gray the background, that means don't enter anything. Users usually get that. Don't create backgrounds that will confuse the users. The standard list box, and we've got multiple kinds of list boxes here. We've got the drop-down list box. We've got the list box where we can see everything. We've got list boxes where you can select one item and list boxes where you can select multiple items. However, for basic general good interface design, okay, the drop-down list, which is a list type of list box for a single selection is a good choice. 
The reason it's a good choice is because so many people use it for specifically that, that people know it quite well. That's it. That's why it's good, okay? It's also called a combo box. The multiple selection list box tends to confuse users, okay? Now, there's a lot of alternatives to the multiple selection list box, such as the summary box, which allows you to choose from the left, know what you've selected because it shows up over on the right, and it gives you a bunch of tools, but it takes up a tremendous amount of screen real estate, and it also confuses some groups of users, okay? I'm not gonna tell you which is best and which isn't best, because you don't know until you know the task and the user. It's that simple. But you know what your options are. Scroll bars, sliders, those are all very useful in specific situations where you've got bounded information. Okay, just scroll it over. But remember, scroll bars are typically not tremendously accurate, but you can have incremental, incremented scroll bars where it actually jumps to specific integer values. Okay, they're usable. And, and actually, I, I tend to like them. They're kind of usually fun to just, you can get, a re, you can see the relationship of the scroll on things like when you're doing a color saturation. How much red, green, and blue do you have? And those are done in scroll bars. And you move them around and you get, you know, it means more to you to have the shade of, the, the level of blue than it does to have an RGB number, like an RGB number being a number like between zero and 255. The scroll bar has more meaning. So easy. Quickly adjust. The tabbed interface. Sometimes you got a lot of information you need to put in. Now, that you need the, well, you don't need to put it in, the user needs to put it in, and you've gotta be able to put all of that somehow into a small amount of screen real estate. And one of the, the ways to do this, which is done very well, is the tabbed interface, where you've got discrete categories that you can put this information into, create a bunch of tabs, have a common set of buttons at the bottom so you save screen real estate there, it works quite well, and, I, and for the most part, tabbed interfaces work very well with most users. But remember, the concept, the reason for that tabbed interface was quick access to groups of information when you had a tremendous amount of information that needed to be entered with a limited amount of real estate on the screen. So knowing when to use them is also important. The tree view. Um, I would say for most advanced users, a tree view is quite usable. However, uh, and, and most users are going to have to have some familiarity with the tree view because it's the way that we do the hierarchy of files and folders when you're saving and retrieving information. However, if you go out and watch end users that use Windows, you'll find that they've saved 5,000 documents in documents and haven't created a single folder. The concept of the tree view is completely lost on them. It is what it is. Again, these are the interface tools that you've got available to you to create designs in a common PC-based environment. And these are things that users will understand for the most part. But that doesn't mean all users will understand them. It all still boils down to the understanding of the task and the understanding of the user but you also have to have a knowledge of the tools that you've got available. Now we're gonna talk more about different tools because this is just one environment in HCI that you're gonna deal with. You're also gonna deal with phones, you're also gonna deal with tablets, it brings forth a whole new group of different types of tools that you've got to work with. But at least at this point, you should have an understanding of users, tasks, and the tools, the widgets, the pieces of things that you've got to play with to create these user, user interface designs. You need to know them. You need to know how they work. You need to know the best practices associated with them. And you need to know how to take them and make an effective design using them. That's the bottom line. So Daytona State, I hopefully get, gave you some great information on how to design interaction. This is Dr. Ron England signing out. <laughs>